In 1987, when two teenage girls are murdered in Thunder Bay, Canada, the police fear the worst. I immediately thought that we had a serial killer working the area. Police think they've got their man, but a psychic says they're wrong. I feel terrible, but I had to tell him. I'm having trouble recognizing the face I see. In the public's mind, it was going to be sort of a miracle if anybody was caught because so much time had elapsed. Then, 13 years later, a stone-cold case comes back to life. Was the psychic right all along? I knew I had seen that face so clearly. On the shores of Lake Superior sits Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. In the 1600s, a fur trading post. Today, a struggling industrial town. On Sunday, May 10th, 1987, Mother's Day, an elderly couple out on their morning walk discover the body of a young woman laying in a gravel pit. First to arrive on the scene is Constable Jerry Moran of the Ontario Provincial Police. The body was located right in, in the area here. The uh, top had been pulled up and her jeans were undone. Her shoes were removed and laid beside the body. Police comb the scene and find a plastic bag containing a beer bottle and what appears to be the undergarments of their victim. The thing that was going through my mind at the time was uh, somebody's Mother's Day had been ruined for the rest of their lives. But Detective Moran has a job to do and puts his personal feelings aside. It, you treat it very businesslike, you're, you're detached. Uh, any uh, short-lived evidence, anything that, that weather could, could uh, destroy, we have to try to preserve that as fast as possible. At the scene, police also find shoe prints and tire marks. The young woman is identified as 17-year-old high school student Donna Tebenham. The body of 17-year-old Donna Tebenham was found yesterday afternoon in a gravel pit north of the city. As for detail, that's about all the OPP is releasing so far. The circumstances surrounding it dictates that uh, we are, or have, forwarded the uh, body to the Centre of Forensic Sciences in Toronto uh, for expert examination. Donna Tebenham was your typical 16-year-old girl. You know, she went to school, she had friends. Julio Gomes is a local journalist for the Thunder Bay Chronicle. I've lived all my life in Thunder Bay, and at the time I was... Uh, a teenager as well, and I know my own feeling was one of shock. An autopsy reveals she died of asphyxiation. There were small traces of alcohol in her body, but no drugs. A sample of semen is also recovered. Another curious clue. Tiny specks of blue paint were lifted from her clothing. The, the blue paint was uh, at one point used on a specific year of pickup trucks. Anybody that wanted to paint their vehicle could, could have painted it that blue, but we had established based on the wheelbase and the axle width that it was a truck. Police learned that Donna had spent the previous evening visiting friends. She was last seen walking back from a local corner store at about 11 p.m. Calls from the public kept police busy, but brought them no closer to a suspect. We had so many suspects or what could be considered uh, persons of interest. But as it turned out, uh, in, in, in all the cases, it was a dead end. People uh, would, would come forward and, and just say that uh, they have reason to suspect this person because they said something. They said they may have seen this girl at a party or they said that they went to school with this girl and, and uh, they've done things to this girl and things like that. Just, there were blowhards at a party, most of them, that would just uh, want to get attention for themselves and, and admit to doing anything and uh, all these, these guys were subsequently ruled out as, as suspects. Another snag. Partial fingerprints found on the beer bottle at the scene turn up no matches. With no suspects and with no DNA testing in 1987, the semen sample sat on the shelf. The most promising clue police had appeared to be the blue repaint chips found on the body, but record keeping back then was less exact. Tracking down a blue repainted truck had to be done by sight. In this particular case, we were looking for a, a travel all, or an international travel all truck. It's like a, it's like an old Chevy Suburban. So there weren't too many of them around. So we were we were tracking those things down, and we spent months looking for everybody that was registered or had ever owned one of those. 
And uh, so that, that's all time consuming. Thunder Bay is a small town, and there are unfortunately a lot of other unsolved murders that take place. And every couple of years, you'd have someone that disappears and they're never found. Then, Friday, August 7th, another body is spotted off the side of the road, just a few miles from where Donna Tebenham was murdered three months earlier. The second victim is another Thunder Bay High School student, 16-year-old Bernadette LeClaire. We were supposed to go dancing. I didn't hear from her. I, I, I knew something was wrong. David Binquis was Bernadette LeClaire's boyfriend at the time she went missing. And I was just happened to be flipping through the newspaper, and uh, they had a little article about a native girl found in the power lines. My heart almost jumped out of my chest. The crime scene appears chillingly familiar to Constable Moran. The victims were uh, the same age. There was no obvious signs of, of violent death, but there was a plastic bag put over her head. Shoe prints and tire tracks match the Donna Tebenham scene. Police also make another key discovery. We found uh, blue repaint chips on both bodies. I uh, immediately thought that we had a serial killer working the area. Then police get a promising lead. A woman walks into the station and says she knows who the killer is. She claims her boyfriend, who we will call Ron Newman, picked up a woman at the same corner store where Donna Tebenham was last seen the night she went missing. She was allegedly an eyewitness to, to the actual apprehension. So the police questioned him, and then they arrested him. And he was charged with uh, two counts of murder. Attorney Lee Baig had been working on Ron Newman's case since the day the arrest was made police fingerprint Newman, but the prints don't match, and he doesn't drive a blue truck. But police aren't giving up so easily. We couldn't rule him out as a suspect just due to the fact that his prints didn't match what was found on, at our scene. Uh, he could have been wearing gloves. He could uh, very well not have touched anything. Nobody minds defending a guilty person, um, but when it's an innocent person, um, the task becomes so much more serious because you dare not make a mistake and police would learn that they had made a big one. At a preliminary hearing, the OPP's case against Ron Newman falls apart. Well, she just didn't withstand cross-examination to the extent that the Crown had absolutely nothing to go on. There was no connection between my client and the murders whatsoever. Finally, after spending six months in jail, the charges are dropped. He was released, but unhappily for him, there was no one else to point the finger at. We weren't uh, defeated. We were, we were still interested in pursuing the case, uh, albeit from a different angle. That different angle was a psychic. One evening, I was watching uh, a documentary that involved a, a woman by the name of Noreen Rainier. The use of psychics in police investigations is commonplace, but in Canada, almost unheard of. Will the psychic lead the OPP to a brutal serial killer? I saw so clearly the face of the murderer. In Thunder Bay, Ontario, the murder of two teenage girls has the city demanding answers. Police have a suspect, but not enough evidence to convict. Desperate for clues, a cop calls a psychic. She had been successful with several American uh, agencies, so I thought we had nothing to lose. Noreen Rainier is a psychometrist who specializes in missing persons and homicide cases. I like uh, touching something off the victims, and metal is better for me. It seems to be a better conduit. It, it holds the energy or images of what that individual saw just before he or she was killed. Detective Moran sends her a pair of earrings found on Donna Tebenham, as well as a necklace from Bernadette LeClaire. When I first start a, a, a case, I have to prove to the police that I'm real. And so I always tell them a few things they already know, usually how the person was killed, what he or she looked like uh, when they were alive, a few things like that to gain their confidence in me as a, a credible psychic. And then uh, they can ask questions, and my mind uh, just sees what they ask. Yeah, I, I felt a little weird about the whole thing. I'd never been involved with a psychic. I'd never, I'd never even been to a tea reader, you know, but... Uh, I figured, what you know, if it works, who am I to argue with it? Like most of her cases, Noreen conducts her reading with Moran over the phone. 
when I held Donna's earring, uh, I remember seeing her sort of light brownish hair, and, and I feel she had problems with her S's. I see braces. She described the, the uh, victims uh, very accurately, uh, right down to uh, the speech impediment on Tebenham and the character of Leclerc. I had Bernadette's necklace, so it wasn't that difficult to be able to describe her. Busted. I felt more fuller lips. Yeah. I felt more, more feisty, confident, uh, a little bit rebellious, again young. Then Noreen astounds Moran by describing the murder. Remember, I couldn't breathe. Screaming. I'm having trouble breathing. Didn't feel any knives or guns or wounds of that sort, just not breathing. Uh, it started, you know, being a little uh, unusual that she would know some of this stuff. Uh, and I certainly wasn't given this information to her. Again, I closed my eyes and I could feel, uh, first of all, I felt a truck. And it was blue, it was low, and it had a, a sort of a, a flat thing in the back of it. I was somewhat surprised because that's the, the, the color of the vehicle we were looking for based on the paint chips found in both scenes. The eyes, I'm seeing the eyes now. Uh, on a face, when I close my eyes and I'm trying to describe the murderer, I don't see the whole face at one time. But the whole face is what the police need. So Noreen sets up a circle group, hoping to get a clearer picture of the killer. I, I'm seeing an eye. Uh, a circle group uh, is people with like minds. We're all, all hopefully trying to get the same answers. I was teaching at the time an ESP course, and some of my students had heard about the case that I was working on, and they wanted to become involved in it and help me see more. Large ears, more closer to the head. It was so clear. I saw it so clearly. I knew, I knew that if I had my artist draw it, that we would have a face for Constable Moran. She subsequently got a hold of, uh, of a sergeant from uh, an American police force that uh, had worked with her before, and uh, based on her description, he drew a composite sketch of what she thought our suspect should look like. Length. Uh, there was just a small space between the upper lip and the nose. I made a photostat copy of the sketch and sent it to uh, Constable Moran uh, and waited to hear uh, what he had to say. When I got the Polaroid picture of the composite sketch, it didn't look like anybody in particular that we had looked at. Nothing. They didn't know who it was. I was devastated. I was felt so like I was on and he didn't know who my face was. I was just totally devastated. It looks like another dead end, but Moran is not willing to give up just yet. He sends the psychic a stack of photos, including the photo of Ron Newman. I didn't really recognize anyone in the lineup. I felt terrible, but I had to tell him. I'm having trouble recognizing the face I see. At that point, I was, I was somewhat disappointed, but uh, I knew that, that uh, there was no point in, in, uh, in pursuing something that wasn't there. But before the cop gives up on the psychic, he has one more question. Will we uh, get him and, and uh, when, when will we arrest him? And I said, yes, he's going to be 32 years old. He's going to have a mustache. And I saw the initial R. I didn't know if it was first or last name, but I saw R. Moran is stumped by Noreen's clues. Ron Newman was 32 years old, and he had the letter R in his name. But the psychic sketch looks nothing like him. The description that she made, really, it was a stretch to make it fit Newman. The last conversation I had with Constable Moran was when he sent me the lineup of the faces, and that was the last time we spoke. At that point, the, uh, the case uh, didn't go very much further. I was taken from the case and put back on general duties uh, because there was no other avenues of investigation to, uh, to pursue. I questioned my ability. How could I see so clearly and it be so wrong? What was wrong? What, my mind, what was happening? The case goes cold. Two 16-year-olds are dead, and their killer is still out there. 
Police run occasional Crime Stoppers television spots, but no new leads surface. It always seemed like they were at a dead end, and that really, in, in the public's mind, it was going to be sort of a miracle if anybody was caught because so much time had elapsed. In fact, 13 years go by. Then, science steps in and reignites a cold case and confirms a psychic's long-forgotten vision. How could I be so wrong when I had seen so clearly? In Thunder Bay, Ontario, the murder of two teenage girls remains unsolved. Thirteen years pass, and then a breakthrough in fingerprinting technology offers new hope to cold cases. In August of 2000, an automated fingerprint identification system known as APHIS was upgraded to search and retrieve both finger and palm prints of convicted felons. This led to numerous cases uh, being cleared up, uh, and one of them was the Tevin M. LeClaire case. Partial prints found on a beer bottle and a plastic bag at the scenes could now be compared against pools of fingerprint records. APHIS turns up a hit, and the owner of the prints is Larry Runholm. In 1990, three years after the murders, Larry Runholm, a native of Thunder Bay, had been arrested and charged with drinking and driving. His fingerprints were forwarded to the RCMP and remained on file for 10 years, until the new technology made the match. A case that has baffled cops for 13 years is finally solved. On July 11, 2000, Runholm is charged with the murders of Donna Tevenham and Bernadette LeClaire. It was a huge story when, when he was arrested uh, because the community had almost forgotten about these deaths and, and the few people that still remember it had almost given up any hope that anyone would ever be arrested and held to account for it. The arrest finally vindicated a psychic who 13 years earlier accurately described both girls, their dark hair, Donna's braces, and Bernadette's feisty personality. She even envisioned their deaths. I'm having trouble breathing. But it was her sketch of the killer that police turned a blind eye to years ago that now came back to haunt them. The profile provided by Noreen Rainier uh, regarding a suspect uh, turned out it uh, was, uh, was amazingly accurate. At the time of the murders, uh, Mr. Ronholm was only 19. We have a high school photograph, uh, Mr. Ronholm. The uh, prominent nose, the full mouth, the uh, length of the hair. Other puzzling clues offered by the psychic now seemed to make sense as well. I remember uh, Constable Moran saying, will we get him and when will we arrest him? And I said, yes, he's going to be 32 years old. He's going to have a mustache. And I saw the initial R. I didn't know if it was first or last name, but I saw R. So I was overjoyed that my information was right. Sad that it didn't help in a timely manner. Run home admits to intentionally killing both girls and avoids a jury trial by pleading guilty to second degree murder. And Larry Runholm never took the stand never explained anything. His lawyer said he's, he, he has no memory of what happened, so he has nothing to offer. Runholm claims he can't remember what happened back in 1987 when the girls, both 16, were believed to have been raped and then suffocated three months apart. But Justice Stanley Carisco, in his sentencing address, says he saw no evidence of amnesia, and he says the families deserve an explanation for these sickening murders. You know, the guy is a, uh, a vicious killer, um, sadistic, and... Uh, uh, the judge saw through him, and I'm, I'm very thankful for that. To this day, the police don't know exactly what happened the nights the two girls went missing. What they do know is that both girls were suffocated with a plastic bag. DNA testing of semen taken from both girls matched Larry Runholm, and blue paint chips found on both girls matched the paint and make of the truck he drove. Why did he do it? And, and how could he live with himself? for the next 15 years, where ostensibly he was raising a family and leading a normal life. It's one of those just baffling things that you constantly think about and say, you know, what, what really happened? His plea of second degree murder carries an automatic life sentence. The ruling of 20 years came as some satisfaction and closure for the families of the victims. 
second degree murder for, for, two, for two girls I would have liked to have seen, you know, 22 if not a little bit more. Um, but I am pleased it's over. There was a certain amount of uncertainty that we had uh, stepping in here today and, and uh, just wondering where the judge was going to end up. So at 20 years, I, 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 think, um, I think my sister was well served. Look at that, how many lives he's destroyed. I don't think he got what he deserves, but I know he'll get what he deserves where he's going. If the police had used the psychic sketch in their investigation, would the murders have been solved sooner? An article published a few weeks after Runholm's arrest revealed that police did have him in their sights, but he was somehow overlooked. He had lived on a road with his parents, and his parents were away all summer at a tourist camp, which they ran. And so he had the run of the house, came and went as he pleased. His house was on the same route that myself and my partner did a door-to-door -door knock on. And as it happens that the one side of the road that my partner was on was the same house that Mr. Runholm lived in. And he wasn't home the, the two times we went there. But we had, at that point, we had no reason to suspect Mr. Runholm of anything. He was just another name to be cleared. The police just using me is right, but they are not used to working with psychics, so they don't understand how we work and how they have to interpret our clues. It's not all factual the way in this reality. My goal, and still will be till it happens, is to train and teach the detectives how to do what I can do. In, uh, in hindsight, the clues that Miss Rainier provided, although we were disappointed uh, that we weren't able to successfully charge suspect number one, uh, it, it did prove to be very accurate for suspect number two, uh, although 13 years down the road. I'm glad I used the psychic because it uh, sort of opens up uh, a whole new avenue of investigation. We had nothing to lose by, by using her and everything to gain. How dare I had doubted my own psychic ability. Uh, so yes, I was joyful. Uh, and knowing that my ability was working and does work, and again, like fate, don't doubt, believe.